My guest at this time is legendary veteran, 20 plus year WWE referee veteran. He is here to host or co-host with me the latest edition of It's All Greek to Me on the Wrestling Inc. Daily. It's Jimmy Corderas. Jimmy, welcome back to the Wrestling Inc. Daily. Well, thank you as always for having me back. And what can I say? Opa! It's all Greek to me, my friend. <laughs> Pour your ouzo, right? You know, exactly. Throw on your mama mia. We're going to have some fun here today, everybody. Um, last night was full gear. Jimmy, you put out your latest ref and rant. Mm-hmm. You seemed positive, yeah. largely, but mm-hmm. you also teased that you would have preferred maybe some tweaks to the show. So let's start right there. What are some of the tweaks you feel like you would have made to the card last night? Okay, uh, um, I, I hate to, to to do this to you, Nick, but let me start with the positives. I enjoyed the pay-per-view. I don't want people to think that, oh, here he goes again. He's after AEW, that WWE shill and blah, blah, blah. And No, I really did enjoy the pay-per-view. From a fan standpoint, I sat back, I looked at it, I said, you know what? This is entertaining. I'm having fun with this. And you were there live, were you not? I was there live, yeah. And, and I can only imagine how it felt being there in the arena because I've been to the Target Center many times. So, I, I you know, it, it kind of hearing that audience made made me enjoy the pay-per-view more. I just, there's those little tightening of the screws, as they call it, that need to be done, in my opinion. That kind of, again, don't want to focus on the negative things, but to me, they stand out and they are, I don't want to say hampering, but they're a little bit of a roadblock to AEW advancing to that next level. And one of the things is, and I hate to keep harping on the brothers and sisters in stripes, but man, they've got to do something about uh, the referee work there. It is so inconsistent. One of the things, I'll I'll give you an example. In a lot of the matches, a a lot of action was taking place outside the ring. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a problem with them not utilizing the 10 count properly and allowing talent to be out there too long. But then you do this in a match where they're out there for like a half minute, a minute or so doing their thing. Then later on in the match, you're teasing a count out spot. Mm-hmm. You know, it, to, to me, that makes zero sense. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and I don't put the full blame on the referees. Partial blame goes to the talent as well, because they've got to know better. It is it is kind of wild right now seeing uh, talent like Bobby Fish or Punk or Brian coming into the company who have that uh, years of WWE experience because it's noticeable to me how those talents have been uh, much more attentive to those kinds of issues than a lot of the talent that don't have kind of the experience of the WWE guys coming in. I don't know if that's something you've noticed as well. I have noticed, but it, it again, it goes up to the top. And, and you have all those... Uh, wonderful minds backstage everybody from arn and tully to billy gunn to dustin and uh, somebody I, I don't understand how somebody has not reached out or is it just the talent just not paying attention to these veteran minds and i and i hope that's not the case because old school and new school can exist together yeah and and i know i was texting with you during the show especially during that buy-in the the, mm-hmm. the women's tag match um because there was a lot of outside interference spots during that match. And as somebody who used to be a manager, like I took such pride in being able to organically watch the ref turn slip in there as quickly as possible. Keep my eyes on the ref because as soon as I see you start to turn, that's when I try to hide, right? Like that's the dance you do. Mm -hmm. It was driving me a little batty watching these refs just turn around and seemingly kind of wait. They were, they're like watching the wrestlers. It's like a different kind of cadence than at least what I was taught to do with, with spots like that with the referee. No, absolutely. And like you said, get in, get out, and do it fast. Do the dirty deed. It, it doesn't look like that the heels are manipulating the referees to get them out of position so they don't see what they're not supposed to see. And those spots are taking far too long, too. Yeah. The longer it takes, the more it's like, okay, just stay with me, just stay with me. Well, how long can the referee argue with you for? You know what I mean? It's just, okay, <clears throat> get in, get out, get it done. Um, well, uh, how did you, let's, let's start with the, some of the top line items here. So Adam page main event, uh, two years were the payoff here with him and Kenny Omega. Do you think that this, uh, delivered on, on the two year build that we got for these two? I think it actually did. I, I enjoyed the match very much. I thought they told the heck of a story in the match. And like you said, a two year build, I love stories that, that, that take time to develop and tell. And I know they had to take little breaks here and there for reasons but at the same time 
the story was there in the background all the time. And I think Sunday night was a nice, uh, I don't want to say ending to that story because who knows, we might get the rematch, whatever the case may be. But at the same time, I like the fact that Hangman is now a AEW guy mm. with the AEW championship for lack of a better term. Yes. I know he's wrestled in Japan and he's been everywhere else, but I'm talking about a guy who is a non WWE performer, yeah. former WWE performer holding the title. I just hope, I don't know. We shall see going forward. Will the hangman move that needle that needs to be moved? I mean, like, don't get me wrong. They're doing well in the ratings. They're getting, a, you know, they've appealed to that hardcore audience. They're diehard fans. They need to grow that audience. And hopefully hangman is the guy who can bridge that gap. And it sounds like there's a little bit of hesitation there. Like, it doesn't sound like you're totally sold on the idea that hangman as of right now can, can be, I mean, as great and as feel good as this moment is for hardcore AEW fans. Uh, does Adam Page move that needle? That's I, I I hear that in your voice. There seems to be a little bit of skepticism there, Jimmy. Yeah, there needs to be. Uh, he's he's talented in the ring. Don't get me wrong, because uh, his in ring work is is great. I'm just concerned about the character, him on the mic. I mean, he he did well the uh, last week with his promo work, which is some of the better work that he's done on the mic that I've seen since he's been since he's been on TV and AEW. He needs to elevate that that game that part of his game mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense yeah it, it's interesting because like i told you i i you know yesterday on the show and now that we're doing this all what in chronological or whatever yeah I, when i was talking to jeff jared earlier uh uh there was a little hesitance similarly you know because i said this was the top line out of coming to the show and he was like well was it because there's a lot of the things people are talking about coming out of this show and it's not necessarily all about hangman page and this big AEW title win right now i don't know if that resonates with you as well it absolutely does because moments matter and when you talk about big moments that people that resonate with people that stick in their mind you know you could talk about twisting burning 450 hammer phoenix splashes and all this kind of stuff and that goes on but that title win like you said was two years in the making and that should have been the lasting moment and it was the last thing that people saw going off the air sure so that should have been the moment that resonated and stayed with people and the fact that people are talking about other stuff ahead of this that's what makes me question whether hangman is the guy to move that needle or was it just the circumstances or uh you know of the pay-per-view being uh, having so much jammed into it yeah and you know you talk about how you were happy to see not a, a wwe guy holding this title right now we had two ex wwe guys actually fighting for the chance to hold that title miro uh brian danielson I thought if they were going to go with the page win, which they would, um, I almost kind of held out hope a little bit that Miro would find a way to get this victory. Just because I think that if you're trying to really get Adam page over, you know, a yeah. Miro type, you know, could, could maybe be a, a first great, but instead it, it looks like Brian, unless they go back to Omega here for a rematch, but it looks like Brian is going to be the next in line here. Uh, arguably a bigger baby face than Adam page in the grand scheme of professional wrestling. What do you think about, the decision to to make Brian the number one contender at this point in time. I think it's interesting and I think there's a reason for it. And this is me foreshadowing a little bit and trying to, you know, connect the dots, so to speak. I think that if Miro did go, win that match with Daniel Bryan, people would automatically assume, you know, the smart crowd today would think going into that final match, oh, well, it's, it's Hangman Adam Page is winning regardless. This way with Daniel Bryan winning that match and winning the number one contender spot, now people are starting to question, whoa, wait a minute. Is Kenny going to screw Hangman out of this opportunity? And do we go to Wednesday and, and maybe do something there? Instead, now it's the other way around. Maybe on Wednesday we see Miro come out, you know, questioning himself, questioning his God. Mm. And saying, you know what, Daniel, Brian, Brian Danielson. See, I do it too. It's okay. Brian Danielson, one more opportunity. You give me one opportunity. And if I don't win this, I will leave AEW or something along those lines. And then you can have Miro finagle his way into the championship spot. Interesting. Okay. So you don't think it's a given necessarily. I think that we get Brian and page here in this, in this situation. Cause I I'm interested no. to see what happens if you go heads up with those two, you know, I, I am too, because you know, again, we're talking about it, old school versus new school. Yes. Old school is heel versus baby face. And we're seeing a lot less of that lately with two baby faces fighting two heels fighting that kind of stuff. But I, I still prefer one person you want to see kick someone's butt and one person 
you want to see get their butt kicked as opposed to yay, 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 you know, like the the, and, du the dueling chance. And it's interesting because Tony like kind of defended that and almost like leaned into that in the media scrum after the pay-per-view where he was, he's like, yeah, look, you know, we've done these baby versus baby matches to, to like some, some great success, but it, it does feel like there's a lot of that. Like there's very few truly hateable AEW uh, figures, you know, Omega gets heat. MJF obviously gets heat, but by and large, everybody loves everybody in AEW. That's something I've noticed. Yeah. And you talk about MJF and yes, he generally, he does generate a lot of heat. And I love the fact that he's, he's just, you know, he's MJF 24 seven pretty much. But at the same time on Saturday night, I noticed that people were cheering. There was a, there were dueling chants. There were dueling yeah. MJF chants. Yeah. And especially against someone like Darby Allen, who you're trying to build as a top baby face. Oh man, I don't know. I just, I, I would prefer to see him get that hate more than anything. Now, this is the second big loss in a row, row for Darby, right? Like the mm -hmm. last pay-per-view he lost to Punk. Uh, this time he he did the uh, the job for, for MJF. Um, do you worry about him losing momentum right now? I guess that's kind of what I think you're alluding to when you make that MJF comment there. Uh, maybe a little bit, but at the same time, there's always it's always salvageable, especially with someone yeah. like Darby Allen, because he is so popular with the AEW faithful. I don't want to say he's Teflon like a CM Punk or, or a Brian Danielson or something like that. He's not at that level yet. But at the same time, it is Punk. It, yeah. is, the, it is, for lack of a better term, the top heel in AEW that he lost to. The, at least the most hated one. Mm -hmm. except uh, except for saturday night that is i mean but uh, so there is a way to get him back to where he needs to be and maybe you know uh, or, or is this an opportunity for him to turn heel and maybe turn on his his idol sting oh man wow i hadn't even thought about that i mean i guess mm -hmm. at some at some point you would think it's gonna happen right or maybe the other way around i don't know if heel sting works at this point in time no, I think he he's past the point of being a heel. Uh, you know, he's he's a legend. He's an icon. I I just can't see him being that evil Sting character. But turning on an uh, turning on an icon, turning on a legend like that, and saying, "Listen, I need to do something with my career." And you know what? You're holding me back. You you're an icon. You may be a great teacher, someone to learn from, but you're holding me back. Oh man! And that sets up Darby Sting then, which would be the huge victory he would probably need after something like two back-to-back pay-per-view losses like this. There you go. There you go. That would be awesome, man. In my wow. opinion, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like I tell people, it's like sometimes I get emotionally attached to to booking ideas, and when they don't happen, I'm like genuinely sad. Like, yeah. I think you put a nugget in my head right there, Jay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, the, the fantasy booker in me, the fantasy pencil. <laughs> so so uh, you brought up punk, punk Kingston, hell of a build, right? I mean, yeah. probably the best, I think, segment AEW has just ever done. I, I mean, I don't I don't think there's been a better 12 minutes of AEW television, period. Did this match deliver on the hype around it? I think it did. This that was a hard hitting match. Then and, and you know, you take the blood out of it. it it's the blood wasn't the, the symbol of hard hitting these two guys you know they they laid it in there and they laid it all out there and you can question whether punk going over or eddie kingston going over was the right or wrong call the bottom line is i like to see where these two go next especially after the yeah. you know punk offered his hand at the end of the match eddie fluffed him off and walked out do we have a a, a part two and maybe Maybe Eddie gets a win here, and then we have, you know, the tiebreaker. Isn't it kind of wild, like, how lost uh, you can get in this? Where the handshake, to me, uh, I couldn't tell if that was planned or not. And I think that's what I'm enjoying most about the Punk-Eddie dynamic. And the reason I hope I get more mm -hmm. is because maybe Punk really did want to show Eddie respect in that moment and was expecting that handshake back. I don't know. You yeah. know, we don't know, but I love not knowing that if that makes sense. You know? No, it makes absolute sense because when you watch that promo segment leading into the pay-per-view, when they went back and forth and you felt the realism in their shots back and forth at each other, you know, calling him a bum and saying, you, nobody wants you here in that locker room right now, you know, you've been away for seven years and nobody wants you here. It, you see, even those who think they know, don't know, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the beauty of it. I, I, see, that's, 
that's what's missing a lot today. You know, where you, you get, when you start to question yourself as smart as you think you are and you start going, wow, that was a hell of a shot. Was that real? Yeah. Were they laying it in? Hmm. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and you know, we had another kind of, uh, you know, dangerous bout, right? The six man falls got anywhere match. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you, but I was a little surprised that Adam Cole's team didn't pick up the victory with kind of the push that Brian and punk and, uh, have been getting, you know, as these, you know, really undefeatable talents. I know, I know Cole didn't take the pin, but right. I was surprised to see that his team didn't come up uh, victorious there. Yeah, I was a little surprised as well. But then again, you know, it's it's a feel good moment for the baby faces. I guess that was the idea behind it. And uh, I I hope it wasn't one of those situations where they don't want to show that the EVPs are above uh, <laughs> do do putting over talents, so to speak. But um, from a story standpoint. I, I'm with you. I think I think there, there's more legs to the heels, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, squeezing out a win against the baby faces using nefarious means. Sure. I'm just yeah. surprised, like, considering the investment they seem to have made in Cole, I thought that he'd kind of get similar treatment to Brian and Punk. That's all I was surprised mm -hmm. by. You know, it was a yeah. great moment for, for obviously Drastic Express and, and yeah. Kate. You know, no, absolutely, absolutely. No, I totally agree. It's just it, it was a little bit surprising. I thought. Anyways, would you like? Funny. Would you like to see the undisputed era reunite in in AEW? Do you think that'd be fun television? Um, it, it would be interesting. It was again. It'll be one of those situations where if you see them come together, do they want to reform, or is you know what would be interesting now that you brought it up because I didn't even think of that. If they start to, if they all end up in AEW in some form or fashion. Wouldn't it be interesting to see the the elite minus Adam Cole versus the former Undisputed Era? I'm I'm all about it. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways you could go with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you look over. I mean, Kyle O'Reilly. I think reports are that his contract comes up in January. Mm -hmm. You look at how they're booking him in NXT 2.0 is like the goofy nerd lackey to Van Wagner. I mean, yeah, that that booking smacks to me of a guy you know is on the way out the door right now. I don't know if that's the same with you. Uh, yeah, I, I get that feeling, but at the same, again, I don't want to think that way, but it, you can't help but think that way. How do you feel about NXT 2.0, Jimmy? Just in general. Uh, um, I, I liked NXT, uh, OG version for lack of a better term, because that appealed to right into my wheelhouse of, of what I personally like, you know what I mean? And, and it almost feels like they're trying to turn it into what, Raw and SmackDown used to be back in the day where it was more character driven, more uh, um, vignettes, storylines. What, what I, I don't mind that as much. It's just that I don't think they're introducing the new characters, except for Tony D'Angelo. We got at least a few weeks of him in vignettes, seeing him walking the streets of Chicago and and talking and trying to and getting to know him a little bit before he debuted. It feels like we're getting a lot of new talent just kind of thrust out there. Yeah. Without an introduction. I like to see more of an introduction. I like to say, hey, tell me a little bit about this person before I see them in the ring. Yeah. It's a real sink or swim, sink or swim type environment at the moment. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's how it feels. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, back here real quick, just a couple of AEW things. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about America's top team? Did you like the uh, MMA guys getting in the ring? Were you a fan of that six or ten man tag, I guess, there? Uh, um, it was... It was what it was supposed to be. I just found it odd that you have a Minneapolis street fight start off like a regular 10 man tag match. Yeah. <laughs> it, kind of I, I, it was, it was everybody around me in my area. We all said the same thing. Like what? Why? What? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, but then again, I, 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 I didn't have a problem with it. I just, the, I didn't like repetition throughout the, it, there were other parts in the pay-per-view where I thought there were things that were too common throughout several matches and one was this was too too much like the false count anywhere match where a lot of weapons and a lot of ladders and tables and stuff like that uh too, a little too similar my only issue is that with america's top team who's the biggest heel on that side uh dan lambert not the talent not the guys who are in the ring every week yeah so i mean so it, is, it is it is a, it is a push and pull there i get what you're saying because like ethan page and scorps probably don't need a manager, right? No. Like e Ethan page could, could talk anybody in, into those seats. It is a little odd seeing them as like backup to, and I love Dan Lambert. Don't right. get me wrong. I, I just wonder if they're the right talent to be paired 
with a Dan Lambert because like what you're talking about. No, I totally agree. And and of course, a little bias here because Ethan Page is from down the road uh, from, from me here. The good Canadian kid, as they like to say. Uh, I, I know the talent there and I know how he can talk. And, and, and Scorpio Sky, same thing. I mean, like... Psh, psh. I agree with you. I, they don't need a manager. They can they can handle the mic very well themselves. Maybe they maybe there it is. There's there's your breakaway from from at least America's top team. Sure. Um, well, last thing I want to ask you about from Full Gear, then I got I got one or two WWE questions here. Okay. Um, lone women's match on the show: Britt Baker versus Ty Conti. What 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 is your take on the state of AEW's women's division at the moment? I think the potential is there. They have a fo- solid foundation of women. They just need to find a way to present them um, all as viable, you know, talent. It, it, I, I just don't think they invest enough time in their women's division. I think they just throw them out there. And if, to me, it feels like they throw them out there and say, hey, go out there and do your thing. And it's mm-hmm. like there's no like structure, there's no guidance, so to speak, uh, yeah. except for Britt. Britt is, you know, she can like we talk about handling yourself in the ring and on the mic. She can do it. Yeah, she is the total package. She just needs someone to be uh, to help get to her level. Yeah, yeah, I, that's the thing. Dancing partners. I look yes. at I I look at Taya Valkyrie and Ember Moon on the market right now, and I know that there's like two or three more weeks till they're going to be readily available. But mm-hmm. I I think that them being infused in you know putting women in there that know how to tell these stories and work in a main event. I mean, Taya Valkyrie knows how to work a main event yeah. program. I have I mean like yeah. I have no idea why that didn't work out in NXT. She's going to go back to AAA and be a huge star immediately again. You know. Oh. Oh, I totally agree. And I don't, I, again, how, why things don't work in NXT, maybe the change that's going on has something to do with it. <sighs> again, I, try to put your finger on it. <laughs> Not easy to do. So we're heading into Survivor Series. Mm-hmm. Um, big four. B- big E versus Roman Reigns. How do you how do you book this one, Jimmy? Because how, how do you get out of this one? This is a tough one because, uh, y- you know, you have someone like a Roman Reigns who's gaining, so, he's just been on f- hitting hitting homers practically every week i mean i love where the character is gone i love his his presentation every week i, I you almost be, like we talk about believability you almost believe that he's the a-hole that he portrays himself to be on television yeah. and totally. that's the beauty of it and, but at the same time you have someone like a big e this is his time to shine you want to elevate him and that title so now you have you booked yourself into a strange position here where neither one of them can afford the loss. You don't want to see Roman Reigns at this point lose a match, but at the same time, you don't want to see Big E take that loss either. There is a way to get around it through interference and all kinds of nefarious means, but at the same time, I, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy, Jimmy, but I, I think, I think Big E and, and likely with some shenanigans, but I think he might win here. Like, I think that, it's obvious that like he needs this way more than Roman Reigns. Right. And the mm-hmm. whole stuff on SmackDown, just with the, the beating down of woods and the crown and I'm the King. I mean, Big E on the war path to avenge his friend who finally, you know, hit the top of the mountain and got what he wanted with King of the ring. I mean, that is a compelling situation to have this guy be the, I mean, Roman doesn't have to lose his title. Right, it's not on the line. True. Is is this a situation where Roman, in the middle of the hottest run ever, does he pick up a loss here? I don't think that's out of the out of the picture. Well, now that you brought it up, of course the wheels keep turning because sometimes it takes a little, you know, after all those ref bumps over the years. But who's to say that we don't see uh, someone like a Brock Lesnar interject himself into this match in some form or fashion and cost sure. Roman Reigns that that title and also bring up that question again? With Paul Heyman, Paul, did you have something to do with Brock Lesnar being there? And then you you continue that storyline so we can get to to that eventual Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns match. Man, these are all good thoughts, right? Um, and I'm still on the hook about Darby Sting. All right, lastly, <laughs> lastly, now the big refrain I'm hearing, and every survivor, every every big four paper, there's always some kind of refrain that kicks up at you know every other year or so. This year, everybody's back to wondering why are there no stakes to Survivor Series matches? I ran a post earlier today with Becky Lynch saying, I I wish there were some kind of stakes 
to my match with Charlotte, even if a banana was on the line. I want to win right. that banana. What do you think are appropriate stakes for Survivor Series, Jimmy? Oh, man, I forget who suggested it, but there was one for the men's five-on-five -five match that the winning team, whether it Raw or SmackDown, the winning team uh, get the last five positions in the Royal Rumble match. Wow. And, uh, and the losing team has to uh, take the first five positions, one through five. Wow. Who yeah, suggested that? It was, oh, man. It, was, it was somebody on the roster. But anyways, I think that would be cool. Was it, was it Xavier? Was it Rome? I don't know and, who it was. And but, then, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. They put stakes out there. You know what I mean? And you can do it with the women's and the men's because I believe the women are having a Royal Rumble match as well, right? They do, yes. They yeah. haven't taken that away from the women's revolution yet. Yeah. Okay, so you can do that for both the men's and women's five-on-five -five match. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, hey, Jimmy, I want to thank you for some more time. It's always great oh. uh, speaking Greek with you. Uh, <laughs> um, is there anything you want to put over here before we wrap up the conversation today? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to plug away here. You know, as you know, I do my ref and rants on a daily basis on all my social media platforms, Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you can get my ref and rant t-shirts at prowrestlingtees.com. See, here's a, a mug that with uh, one of the examples, of course, I'm wearing the other one here and beautiful, mug. you know, yeah. and, and don't forget that, uh, you can also reach out to me on cameo if you want a specialized message. You can get, you can reach me there as well. And speaking of pro wrestling tees, they've got cyber uh, black Friday deals coming up, cyber Monday deals coming up and that goes with cameo as well. So it's not just for me, but for everybody. So reach out, man. 